Pentecost. So you have liturgy, and then you have, well, then they'll talk about the church, and then they'll talk about um, Dei Verbum, or the Word of God, and then they'll talk about um, evangelization or bringing the good news to the secular world. So you kind of got this concentric circles rippling out. Um, so there's a logic of why they tackled this issue uh, first. This is the only document that they had worked from the schema or the kind of, remember they uh, had all these kind of preparatory documents or these kind of rough drafts. So they didn't just sit at the table and stare at each other like, what do you want to talk about? I don't know, what do you want to talk about? Those are the worst meetings ever, right? You have to sort of have um, anti-preparatory um, work done before you go there and then you have a draft, you have something to kind of look at and say, okay, let's start to pick apart this thing. What do we like? What do we don't like? What do we want to edit? So this is the one where they actually um, worked directly from that schema uh, of, to begin this particular document. Okay, we talked a little bit about why tackle this first. Uh, the church uh, adoring and glorifying God comes before else, all else. If the church cannot celebrate the liturgy faithfully and reverently, then all other tasks will fall short. Uh, I remember in seminary, we had one professor who was a very good man. We just, we loved him to death. He always said to us, gentlemen, get the liturgy right. If you get the liturgy right with the sort of warm reverence that it deserves and you do what the church asks you to do and you pray like crazy, your parish will grow. If you mess with the liturgy and you start doing your own thing, well, you're being unfaithful to God. And so your church is going to begin to shrink. It's that simple. So you get the liturgy right, your church will grow. If you start to mess with the liturgy, your church is going to shrink. That was just drilled into our heads, right? And you come with the warmth, come with a sense of joy, and then you kind of gently correct things when they need to be corrected in a particular community. It sets the tone and the direction for the council. Um, one of the most famous quotes there is sometimes you hear like the Eucharist is the source and summon. And that's been pounded for the last 50 years that it's the beginning and the end, or it's the bottom, so to speak, and the top of the mountain uh, of the church's life. No other action in the church can equal its efficacy. This public worship or public prayer of God or an adoration of God, there's no more powerful prayer in the church than the Mass. Uh, sometimes somebody says, well, so-and-so passed away, or, you know, I, don't, um, I, I need help here. I say, have a Mass offered. <laughs> I mean, the Mass is the most powerful prayer before God. So to have those Masses celebrated for loved ones, there's no more powerful prayer that can be said than the Mass, right? Because it's Jesus himself that's being offered to the Father in the Eucharist under, under the appearance of bread and wine. Uh, and then actually in our um, tradition in the archdiocese and in the church, if a priest dies, they send out a little note to all the priests that says, so-and-so, Father, has passed away. Um, you are requested to celebrate three Masses for him. So every single priest in the archdiocese gets that email, and then we are either going to do it personally, our private mass, or uh, like what I do is I send it to Jerry, and I say, Jerry, Father so-and-so has passed away. Please put these on the calendar. So she'll add them to the calendar for us so that those three masses get celebrated for that particular priest. Does that make sense? In my case, I need a lot more than three. I need like 300 uh, just to move me an inch in purgatory. Uh, no other action the church can equal everything, and by the same time, to the same degree uh, as well. Okay, Pat. So, um, why, again, same category, why tackle the liturgy first? Uh, a marked separation, not, not everywhere, right, um, had developed in the celebration of the liturgy, which was seen as kind of the duty of the priest sort of territory. That's his thing, right? His priest, you know, the old mass, so to speak which was seen as the duty of the priest and the people's participation in the liturgy. It was not uncommon for some to pray their rosary or read religious books during the liturgy. Obviously, I'm not alive during this time. Can you tell me your own experience, if that's true or not true? Right? So, like, he's doing his thing. I don't know what he's doing. I'm going to do my rosary here, read my little book, you know, and I'm just going to maybe read the bulletin. So those are called paraliturgical uh, devotions or extra liturgical devotions, they started to creep in. And is praying the rosary bad? No, no obviously it's good. It's just a timing, right? It's just a when do you pray the rosary? When is it appropriate? It's like I, when I was a teacher, for, I had a fourth period class. 
they would not be quiet. They were constantly talking all the time. And I said, everybody, talking is fantastic. We all love it. You just can't do it right now, <laughs> right? So there's a time and a place for everything. So it wasn't the right place for praying the rosary is during the mass, right? The church wants you to participate, not just um, actively by doing stuff, but um, consciously, prayerfully participating in the prayers of the church and with the priest and what the priest is doing at, at the altar in the celebration of the mass. So there was kind of a, a marked separation that started to happen, like this liturgy has no influence on my life, right? It doesn't have any impact. It's not transformative for me. So there was a disconnect that was starting uh, to happen. Not everywhere. You don't want to be like too like broad, but at certain you know, pockets and stuff. Half century of liturgical scholarship, uh, scholarship reforms part of the council. There was a liturgical movement that was happening in the 20th century. Um, and actually, one of the major centers where it was happening was at St. John's University, right? That was one of the epicenters of this liturgical movement uh, that was happening even before the council. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about this. So one of the things you're going to notice is um, these presentations. Um, so what happens is Brendan um, puts them together first. So he puts together the schema, so to speak, the draft draft, and then I take a look at it, and then I edit it, or I might add stuff. So um, he teaches the evening session. He's really strong with, like, developments and historical processes and how did this come about. That's, I've noticed when I read his presentations, that's what he likes, right? He likes that kind of stuff. That's, like, nerdy, right, stuff, right? And we, that's, a lot of people like that stuff. I don't mind it. It's kind of fun. We have church history. I'm more like, what does the church teach, right? Give me the document in its final form of what it is. So it's, it's just a different way of, you know, learning. So you're going to see a little bit of historical process here. That's mostly from Brendan. And then you're going to see a little bit like, okay, what do we mean, what do we mean by that? You know, how, what, do we, uh, what, what can we learn from this? Does that make any sense? So we have a little bit of a hybrid here. So you can kind of guess, oh, that looks like it's from Brendan. And that looks like it's from Father Andre <laughs> type of thing. So why don't you go ahead and go to the next slide there. So um, this French word, ressourcement, is uh, uh, returning to the sources. Uh, so what the church wanted to essentially do uh, in the early 60s was to kind of open up the treasure chest, right? And we have all this wonderful, um, these theological documents. We have writings of the church fathers. We have sacred scripture. We have writings of the saints. And so the church said, let's revisit and look at some of that, of what the church fathers said and how they celebrated liturgy in the beginning of the church. And let's go back to the kind of the treasure trove, so to speak, of the church's wisdom. And, and then we can uh, appropriate that and let's represent it in a way that maybe the church can be um, find lively and fruitful today. So ressourcement is kind of this return to the uh, sources. And then you have this kind of scholarly movement in Catholic circles. Virgil Michael, you probably never heard that name before, but he's a really big name in terms of like um, liturgical renewal and uh, devotion and, and prayer around the liturgy. Um, he wrote, um, founded a journal called Arate uh, Fratres, was Pray Brothers, a liturgical press at St. John's, uh, right in Collegeville. And then there's pursuit of historical and theological study of ancient liturgies and sacraments. So kind of look at the history of how liturgy has developed and formed over time. So the church is really kind of aimed at reconnecting uh, liturgy back to her roots, so to speak, and the church to her mission and the uh, central mis uh, mystery of the liturgy. So what it wants to do is to join the mystical body of Christ, which is the church, to the worship that Jesus offers on the cross to the Father, right? So remember at the end of the day, the cross or Jesus' total gift of self on the cross is the most pure worship ever in the history of the cosmos, of the history of humanity. This is the total gift of self of the Son offering his entire heart and his, all, every drop of blood to the Father on our behalf, right, for you and for me. And so the cross, in some sense, is it's, uh, it's adoration and worship of the Father, of total a gift of self. That's, that's love, right? And in that process, it's him also assuming um, all of the sins and all of the uh, violations of the covenant and all of the ways we have offended God the Father. And so as a man, he's taking all of that punishment 
upon himself as a man, right? So even in his body that's all torn apart and uh, the blood that's shed and, the, and the, on the, the, the grief and the abandonment and the humiliation and all that stuff, it's, it's, it's all about love, right, at the end of the day. The Mass is the representation or making present of the cross for us today. And every time, every culture, every place, it's making present of the cross today. Jesus is not sacrificed again and again and again, but rather it's an entering into the same self-sacrificial love of Jesus for you and me. Um, I guess one way is, on the cross, I see how much Jesus loved me, right? And in the Eucharist or in the Mass, I see how much Jesus is loving me now, right now, before my eyes. It's the same offering, except it's just done in a different way, right? Under the appearance of bread and wine. As we'll see, and as you, as you read, I hope, the Second Vatican Council described Christ's mission and the basis of sacred liturgy in two ways, from the Mass Two major things are happening. One is you and I are being redeemed, right? Bought back from our sins, from our slavery to ourself, and the slavery to the devil, and the slavery to the world. So the redemption of mankind is happening in the mass, right? You and I are being justified in the eyes of God. And you and I are being made holy in the eyes of God, saints. That is not the only thing that's happening. The other major movement that's happening in the Mass is God is being glorified or adored or worshipped. And that's a matter of justice. I just heard a talk the other day. Sometimes it's funny how like when you hear something, and you maybe have heard it before, but it, for some reason it hits you in a new way. Like the first time you've ever heard it, you're like, I've heard that before, but why is it hitting deeper right now? It's actually going into my heart. And this, what Scott Hahn actually said, he said the highest form of justice or the most fundamental form of justice is giving God what is his due. And that's worship. What God is due, we, are owed, we owe him that, right? He created us. He loves us. He holds us in being at every moment. He's the source of all being. He deserves our adoration and our praise and our love and our gift. And when we are uh, worshiping at Mass, we are performing an act not only of adoration, but of justice of what God is due, if that makes sense. Does that make any sense? Um, we say lift, um, it is uh, truly right and just, right, in that preface that's there. So somebody who's kind of skipping Mass or that is not that important, that's a grave injustice against God that they're committing, if that makes any sense. You're not giving God what is his due, right, and what he's given to us in the Mass. Okay, so we're going to do a few slides here of Brennan's sort of historical process here. Um, papal reform of the liturgy prior to the Second Vatican Council. So Pius X, uh, we're talking like 1910, kind of that, in that sort of uh, era, uh, time of the 20th century. Um, he's wanting the music to um, move towards Gregorian chant, which is from St. Gregory the Great, this kind of very sacred music that kind of lifts your heart and mind up to God. Um, the Renaissance of polyphony uh, in liturgy. He promotes, he has a real devotion to the Eucharist. And so he says, let's lower the age of First Holy Communion from age 12 to age 7. Now for us, we're so used to age 7 as the age of reason but it wasn't always like that, right? You had to wait a lot longer. So age seven, so all of you who re received a communion at age seven, right? That's all from Pius X. We can thank him for that, right? So you have to thank you so much. He wanted young people to receive those graces that are there. He encouraged frequent Holy Communion, which was not always the standard practice. And in fact, when, I re when you read like Story of a Soul with St. Therese, she was always just so happy when she could receive Holy Communion, and we're like, well, what? what are you talking about? You should receive Holy Communion all the time. That's because it's after her. Does that make sense? She's living before Pius X, so it's receiving Holy Communion is much more rare than it is now. And then he also begins to introduce this kind of active participation in the liturgy. Amen. He goes on to say the primary and indispensable source 
of the true Christian spirit is participation in the most holy mysteries and the public official prayers of the church. The primary, the most uh, fundamental and indispensable, right, um, source of a Christian spirit. In other words, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus to make him known and loved, it is indispensable that you would uh, participate in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, right? Saints, it would be unthinkable for them to miss the Mass, right? That's the basics. That's the floor, right? You've got to get the floor down first, the basis down, and then from that you build your house. So it's the foundation of our spiritual house. Look at that papal tiara, man. Oh, I want to get one of those things, to tell you that much right now. Uh, Pius XII, uh, he wrote an encyclical letter on the liturgy, uh, Mediator Dei, uh, the mediator of God, uh, which was a major um, factor, an influence factor for a Sacrosanctum Concilium, or the um, Most Holy uh, Liturgy. He expanded use of the vernacular, especially in mission ter ter territories and for rites other than the Mass. So you already start to see this movement towards um, one's local language, right? For us, obviously, uh, is English. He shortens the pre-communion fast to three hours. What was it before that? Twelve. Whoa. That's why people are getting married at midnight, right? Like, oh, I can't even. I want to, like, yeah, 12-hour fast before. And now it's down to what? An hour. Gosh. And it's not even an hour before Mass starts. It's like an hour before communion. Basically, the church is saying, don't be eating cupcakes during the Liturgy of the Word. Right? Take it easy. You can make, you can make it. It's okay. So uh, they're very lenient, right? It's very lenient right now. I do appreciate when uh, folks who come to confession, they say, look, I, I have to admit that I was sloppy and um, disrespected the Eucharist and I didn't keep the fast, you know, for an hour. I mean, I should be able to do that. I appreciate your honesty in that, you know? I really do. So when people bring that, it's very honest. Uh, he reforms the rites of Holy Week and the Triduum. So you know the triduum that we have, the Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday or the vigil? That's all fairly new, right? It's 1955, the Easter vigil, the Super Bowl liturgy, the two and a half hours or three hours that we have. I mean, it's not that old. In the church's mind, that is not that old. So 1950, that's the high point of the year, right? And some of you love that, and some of you are like, yeah, I wouldn't even call me dead at that thing. That's like three hours. That's way too long for me. Not in the way it does now. No, the liturgy of the light, uh, liturgy of the word, the um, catechumens coming into the church, and then the um, liturgy of the Eucharist. So he really kind of reformed all of that in 1955. Just Saturday morning. Just Saturday morning, exactly. This whole idea of like a Saturday evening mass and things like that, it's fairly new. Then we have good old Pope John the Twenty-Third. He has that 1962 Roman Missal, uh, the final edition of the Mass established by Pope Pius V after the Council of Trent. Um, he has, makes a few changes, too, liturgically, so to kind of show some um, respect to our Jewish brothers and sisters, he removes the word faithless or unfaithful. I mean, he can't really say that entirely, right? That's not it's a, a broad category there. Um, and then... Um, he adds St. Joseph in the canon of the Mass, so the first Eucharistic prayer, as and St. Joseph, right, was there. And then um, we've actually just introduced that more recently into the other Eucharistic prayer, two, three, and four. So now you always hear, and St. Joseph, her spouse, right? But that was only in the Roman canon at first, right, the first Eucharistic prayer, the long one with all the saints that you pray for special liturgies. So we've added St. Joseph in there instead of just the Blessed Virgin Mary. And then um, he likely would have gone further, but with the coming of the council, like, why would you keep going? Like, let the council figure it out. Um, so he, he let the council take care of the rest. So again, Brendan here, this is his slide. Uh, liturgical fundamentals obscured. Various rites were blocked out. The central mystery of what are we doing here at the Mass. Um, paraliturgical or extra liturgy devotions, uh, spiritual reading, the rosary, um, during, happening during Mass. Saints' memorials, they were starting to get, I mean, we love the saints, but they were starting to really kind of crowd out Sunday itself, the day of the resurrection. And then um, you all remember, of course, the high Mass, low Mass type of thing. That's sort of terminology there. And then the sense of estrangement of life of faithful from the liturgy itself. The tendency of the faithful were just kind of following along, 
versus not really praying with the liturgy or entering into the heart of the liturgy. Okay. So a high mass would be like a mass. Um, you want to explain, for those of you that live that, how do you explain that? Full vestments, Full vestments music, lots candles, of lots of incense, high mass, six, six candles, um, bell, think bells and whistles. So like when you buy like uh, lines of cars, you want the one with everything on it, the neon lights and the ground with the rims and everything like that. Or do you want the, just the basic, i got to pull the little lever up, you know, to get out of the car. Uh, type, so low mass, so daily mass versus like an Easter Sunday mass, think of that way. So you even dress for the occasion, right? So the priest would pull out his best vestments for the high mass. And then singing. Yeah, every Sunday, of course, yeah. yeah. Even, even today, we still have that in some sense, right? So there are certain churches like the 7 o'clock a.m. mass, very little music, right? Pretty straightforward. You kind of... Your grumpy people, don't, don't move this and a dial on me or I'll get mad. And then you have your kind of like a 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock AM mass, which is choir and brass and strings and things like that. So how festive is the sort of celebration? Uh, there's your breakdown of the document. So in case you um, want to just take some time and read it, it's worth a read. It's really a beautiful document. Go ahead, Beth. So some goals to uh, strengthen the faith and the mission of the church. Uh, and you think, well, how does that work? So the stronger your liturgy is and the more you're entering into the liturgy, the more you're going to be inspired to bring the good news of Christ uh, to others and to draw them into the liturgy, uh, to adapt to the needs of the age, right? So how many people know Latin today? I mean, not very many, right? So it's kind of hard to kind of follow along. Uh, and encourage the union of all Christians, right? Um, and to recenter liturgy in the life of the church because it enables faithful to express in their lives or portray to others the mystery of Christ and the real nature of the true church. Uh, so again, we just want to make sure that it's, it's relevant for us and we understand what's happening in the liturgy. So these are a couple of my slides that I added here. Um, these are from the book here, um, written, his comments. Well, I really liked some of his comments here. So, uh, again, part of the goal of the liturgy is reconciliation. So that you and I, our sins are forgiven, and that we are united with the life, the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. That his spirit, right, the Holy Spirit, lives in us. And... Uh, reconciliation, I like the fact that he actually broke that apart. In Latin, means to come back together. Um, uh, uh, chilia uh, is eyelash, so it actually just means like eyelash to eyelash with God. Isn't that a beautiful uh, just image there? Eyelash to eyelash. So some of you that have longer eyelashes, you just be really in there with him, right? Yeah. Some of these we wear false eyelashes, you know, it's like, whoa. That's what it all about is the false eyelashes right there, right? <laughs> uh, so we're back into that profound intimacy with your eye, that your eyelashes are touching each other, right? So that face-to-face -face intimacy, looking into the eyes of each other. We, we all know that um, eye contact is a, a way of communication and a way of communion. And two people that are in love look into each other's eyes very differently than other people do, don't they? So the optometrist, right, the eye doctor, does not look in your eyes the same way as your spouse does. At least I hope he doesn't, right? Ooh. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, it's a very different look. So this look of love uh, where our Heavenly Father is looking on us with tremendous adoration and love and gratitude as a father, and we are looking upon him as his children, eyelash to eyelash, intimacy with God. Uh, go back a second there. Um, we have to finish up that slide. Jesus, the new Adam, is our, he is our high priest, and he offers us that right worship with the Father. So Jesus really comes to adore the Father. I love the word adore or adoration, right? So it comes um, ad ora, mouth to mouth. Wow, adoration, ad ora, toward the mouth or mouth to mouth. So one, here's my little thought, was you have to be eyelash to eyelash in order to be mouth to mouth, right? 
Uh, Jesus reconciles us so that we can worship the Father. He opens up this intimacy with the Father. The very heart of God is opened for us. Christ, in some sense, you know, like when his own heart is pierced, so his heart is ripped open for us. He, in some sense, opens up the heart of the Father so we can enter into the very heart of God with Christ, through Christ, and in Christ. Uh, that we may enter into love. So you're entering into the very source of love. If nothing else, if you don't remember anything else besides the hammering and that's going on in there, is to remember, wow, Jesus opens up the very heart of God so that our Heavenly Father shares his heart with us and we share our hearts with him. Uh, Remember, intimacy, to see into me and I see into the life of God and I enter into the very life of God and our hearts are filled when that happens. Okay, the Eucharist is, this is a nice turn here. We always think of, oh, the Eucharist is a gift to us. And Britain does a good job here saying the Eucharist is not primarily Jesus' gift to us. It is first and foremost a gift to the Father. That's just something to think about. At the end of the day, the Mass at the end of the day is a gift to the Father that that Jesus is offering up his life and his heart and his whole way of being to the Father. Uh, and we, in some sense, are brought into that gift up to, to the Father. In other words, we are not the center of the liturgy. That is something that's hard for us as Americans to accept. I am not the center of my own life and the center of reality. God is the center of the Mass. God is the center of the liturgy. And it's really about adoration and worship of Him. And the more I enter into that, the more I come alive and the more I'm actually transformed and the more, um, in some sense, my heart expands. Like, remember the Grinch? Had that little heart that got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So it's like you, 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 your little heart comes, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you become more uh, generous and you forgive much quicker. Jesus is actively incorporating our lives into his worship of the Father at the Mass. In other words, we are not the origin of the liturgy. We are simply participants in it. So I think a lot of the pain and the creativity and all the stuff that happened for so many years could have been avoided had we recognized that fact. That at the end of the day, the liturgy is not about us, right? Um, now it has to be understandable. We have to be able to enter into it. The liturgy is ultimately about God, right? And about the worship of God the Father. And sure, the liturgy is not our thing. It's Christ's work that we participate in for our redemption and for our sanctification uh, as well. Okay? Oh, here's Brennan's slide. Do you know? Uh, So there's Grumpy Cat where he says, well, the park is my church, right? And I'm in charge of the liturgy. Very different mentality than Goldie, who says liturgy is Christ's work, who glorifies the Father in the Eucharist, and offering that we participate in. You see the difference between those two? Very, yeah, Goldie's far happier than Grumpy Cat, right? He's far happier than Grumpy Cat, and you see that contrast between those two mentalities, right? Those two things that are happening there. Yeah, exactly. So the liturgy is the work of Christ, his total self-offering to the Father. And here's something to think about. It's the action of Christ the head and the action of Christ his body, which is who? Us, together, the whole Christ, head and body, that's participating or making this offering to the Father. So, in other words, uh, when the bread and the wine come up, right, the, and, and, you know, the, and the cruets, right, and the, and the patent that comes up, it's a symbolic of this is what we have to offer to God, all of us. That's our offering. So we bring all of our week to, to that Sunday moment, and we say, here's our joys. Here's our sufferings. Here's our challenges. Here's um, our aches and our pains and our celebrations. We bring all of that symbolized the, by the bread and the wine that's offered, brought up to the altar. And so when the priest takes that and presents that to God the Father, 
It's not just Christ the head that's being presented. It's all the people and all of their unique challenges and blessings that they're going through at that particular moment. So when I'm holding up the Eucharist, I'm not just presenting Christ. I'm saying, Heavenly Father, I present Jesus to you under the appearance of bread and wine, but under, I also present all of the faith who are here right now and the struggles and their aches and their desires and what they're going through, and I want that to be taken up as well in Christ, with Christ, and through Christ to you, that you will accept that and that you will transform it and it will be redeemed and it will be brought into that offering. Does that make sense? So it's a very different way of looking at the Mass. Like when you start to understand it, you're like, wow. So I can bring my Monday there. I can bring my Tuesday. I can bring my Wednesday, my Thursday, my Friday. I can bring uh, the things I'm embarrassed, embarrassed about to the Lord. I can bring, oh, I could have did better here. I can bring that happy moment that I had on Friday to him. All of that gets brought. And, and, and as, the, as the host is being held up, there's this a moment of adoration and petitions. You can, you can add your petitions in at that moment when Christ is being adored and when the Father is being adored in Christ. And you think about your week and you bring that to our Lord Jesus. At that, That's participation, if that makes any sense. Very different than on Edna in the back who's reading over the bulletin. Right? She's reading over the bulletin. So what tells me on Edna has not been either evangelized or catechized very well of what's happening in the Mass. Just, it's just need of conversion at the end of the day, right? I'll never forget Bishop Cousins or then Father Cousins. We had a, a class in the Eucharist, and somebody was complaining about, how eh, come they don't pay attention more at Mass or whatever? Like, and he said, well, think about it this way. At the cross, where Jesus is offering himself to the Father, what was happening around the cross? You had all kinds of stuff happening around the cross, didn't you? Some were adoring. And, and, and offering their pains and their sufferings, the Blessed Virgin Mary, John, the beloved disciple, Mary Magdalene are there. They get it, and they're loving with their whole heart. Who else is there? Some are playing games for his clothing. They don't get it at all. They are literally spiritually blind, right? Some are mocking him, Right? You, you said you could, you know, destroy the temple in three days. Take yourself down from that cross, right? Some are just utterly confused. What is going on right now, right? What is going on right now? Like, it's getting dark, you know, this thundering. What the heck's going on right now? So they're confused. He said, if all that stuff is happening around the cross, shouldn't we expect all that stuff to happen around the mass as well? And when he said that, I thought, a light bulb went off in my head. I said, bingo. You're going to see the same exact human uh, experiences and interaction and participation and lack thereof in the mass because it happened around the cross. And instead of getting mad or judging, you know, yeah, I said, okay, I simply bring them to you as well, Lord, and that you'll open their eyes. And what did Jesus pray from the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So you have the heart of Christ. Instead of being all judgy, you can say, you know what? Father, forgive them. They know not what's happening here. And love them. And help me to love them. And help them to experience the love that you've given to me. And that I experience in this Mass is a gift. It's a gift to me. Remember, faith is a gift, right? You didn't earn it, right? It's a gift. So if your eyes are open, you can thank God for that. Because he's giving you a tremendous, tremendous gift. Are you bringing the angels and the saints that we hear are present at the mass? Right They're adoring too. They're all there. Because that's a great point here. Because what does that next point say? The earthly liturgy, or the mass we celebrate here, is a foretaste of the heavenly liturgy toward which we journey as pilgrims, is what uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium. In other words, what we're doing here is already a participation, what they're doing for all eternity in heaven. They're adoring the Father with Christ, through Christ, and in Christ. All the saints who have been open to Jesus and loved him, all the angels, the Blessed Mother is there. And so we are all participating in that eternal offering 
that's happening all the time. It's like we're getting, a, like when it says lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. In other words, kind of uh, the latter is source some corda, lift up your hearts. Um, you're being brought up into the heavenly liturgy at that moment. So in other words, like the veil's being opened in some sense, and you're getting a foretaste of what they're doing in heaven. So in other words, if, you don't, if, if somebody said, well, I don't like the mass, I said, well, <laughs> you're not going to like heaven very much either if you're there. Let's be honest here. If you're there, let's be honest. That's God's choice. But if you're that kind of attitude, you know, type of thing. So get comfortable and love it because it's what you're going to be doing for all eternity, right? Uh, liturgy includes, when we say liturgy, it's not just the mass. It's also the liturgy of the hours, which is those set prayers of the church that priests, religious, and lay faithful. Actually, more and more and more lay faithful are now praying the liturgy of the hours. I'm going to give a little plug here in just a moment. Uh, and then sacraments and sacramentals is all considered liturgy. But none of them have that efficacy as the Mass, right? They all sort of participate in the Mass. Okay. Uh, so you've heard that uh, there's all these different presences uh, in the Mass. So you have the presence preeminently in the Eucharist, right? So the preeminent mode of, uh, of Christ present. He's substantially presence in that very essence of what the bread is changing, the very essence of the body and blood of Jesus. He's present in the bishop when he's here, the priest and the deacon. Remember that I, my um, life is a sacrament, right? So by the sacrament of ordination, the priest kind of makes Jesus present through his personality, uh, through the deacon as well. Um, the deacon makes Jesus present as a servant, Deacon, as a, he, he's kind of configured as Christ the servant. Sacred scripture. Uh, obviously, whenever God's word is proclaimed, it's God speaking to you today. Um, and then you have the lay faithful as well, all the baptized, because you have Jesus living in you. You're the very face of Jesus as well, right, in your uniqueness. So to see, um, um, what is that from Lamism I'm thinking about right now? It's a, to see the face of a person is to love God, or I got to think of that. It's to see the face, to love another person is to see the face of God, right? <laughs> to love another person is to see the face of God. That is such a beautiful line, you know? It's at the very end of Lydia's. Um The whole liturgy, right, is immersed in Jesus. Okay, man. So um, the liturgy is the summit or the end, it's like we're heading towards something, the very top of the mountain toward which the activity of the church is directed. It's also the font from which all its powers flow. So you think of like uh, a well, right? This kind of never-ending well, very heart of God, uh, from which all the powers and graces and love and forgiveness and mercy flow from the Eucharist or from the Mass. Our activity builds up to our liturgical offering, and from the liturgy, we gain our strength for our work in the world. So in other words, we are transformed, uh, we adore God, and we bring the love of Jesus to others. By the way, I was, um, when I first got here, I let folks know on the staff, or a couple, I said, you know, we're going to, I said, at Advent, I'm going to introduce the bells for the um, consecration, right? And, and somebody said to me, well, we're all the body of Christ, and we're all present here at the liturgy. And I said, that's very true. We are. But we only have the presence of Jesus because of the Eucharist, which is the source of the presence in us. So I said, we need to have that sense of heightened, uh, to help our senses really enter into that particular moment when Jesus is made present, which then makes his present in us. And when I said that, there was an awkward awkward silence, right? Very awkward silence. Like, well, I don't like you. <laughs> no, <laughs> just, just whatever it is. <laughs> no, they didn't say that. <laughs> they were thinking it though. All right, next slide. <laughs> okay, now we got this whole section here of, of, of full uh, conscience and active participation. We've heard this 15 million times, right? But let's just talk a little bit about that. All the faithful should be led to take full conscience and active part in liturgical celebrations, 
which is demanded by the very nature of a liturgy and to which the Christian people have a right and to which they are bound by reason of their baptism. In other words, the Mass is so beautiful and wonderful. We want you to participate in it. We want you to share its fruits and to um, be transformed by its glory and how good it is. We want to have the effect on your lives, right? Um, this is the paramount concern of all reform and development liturgies. This is like their number one concern was we want this to be the central mystery in the lives of the baptized. Priests are to receive better formation in the liturgy so they can form the faithful. So this is exactly what we're doing here today, right? So priests are formed well in this. Okay. What is full conscious active participation? Now, as Americans, what did we naturally do? We interpret it in a certain way, right? We, we are busy bees. You've got to be doing something. I need to be active, right? You've got to, I've got to constantly be entertained. I've got to be this or that. Yeah, I've got to be walking around. I've got to be doing stuff. So that was the way that was interpreted. It was not interpreted that way in other countries. But in our particular country, because of our history and our culture, we tended to focus more on that. And not that. that is an aspect of participation, but it's not the full meaning of participation. Does that make sense? Participation is much broader than that. So in other words, um, it doesn't mean more activities and more just sort of doing stuff. Um, there's a, kind of always a trick question. Who is more actively participating in the liturgy, the lector or the person in the pew? We don't know. Yeah, whoever said that, that's a fantastic answer. We don't know because only God knows that. So God knows how much the heart of the person is participating in receiving that word and what the Lord, what the Holy Spirit is doing in the heart of that particular person. Or at the Eucharistic prayer, how he knows who's really attuned to, what, who's, um, to that prayer that's being offered by the priest. He knows what's happening interiorly in the heart of that person. And he's doing something uniquely in the heart of each person. In other words, he's tailoring grace based on the needs of the person. So when that word is proclaimed, it may hit Susie very different than it hits Ed. Well, why? Because Ed is not Susie, and Ed is working through things in his family, in his life, that Susie is not. Does that make sense? That's the beauty of God's word is that grace is tailored. The same thing for the homily. I'm writing it. I'm praying. I'm thinking, oh, great. This is sort of the message I want to communicate or whatever. It comes out gobbledygook in some sense because it's being received based on the mode of the receiver. Like how, what is that person hearing? And what are their needs at that particular time? I can't tell you how many times somebody's come and said, man, that was so great. And what you said there, I'm like, I, I don't even remember saying that at all, right? <laughs> Literally. So they heard something they needed to hear on that particular aspect. Or a word or phrase just causes their heart to jump. And so I'm saying, okay, pay attention to that because that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you and what you need to hear there. It happens to me too. I'm sitting up in the presenter's chair. The words proclaim. I meditated all week on it. You know, I've even written the homily. All of a sudden, I'll hear a word or phrase that just makes my heart jump. And I'm like, what was that? Why did that word just touch me so deeply there? Or that phrase or an image hits my mind. So I have to pay attention to that. If you're kind of a, a recollected person, you'll pause for a second and say, Lord, you want to say something to me there. What is it you're trying to tell me there? I'm listening, right? So pay attention when your heart jumps or you just noticed something about God's word there, whatever it is. Like, wow, I've never, never thought about that before. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Am I speaking Greek? Okay, just make sure you're you know, kind of following me here, right? So all, all I'm saying is pay attention to that heart, your heart there. So you're being in tune. It's like a note and a string that are, that are on, on pitch. Uh, to be contemplatively, contemplatively and prayerfully engaged in liturgical action. So I'm conscious, I'm contemplating, and I'm engaged in God's word, the Eucharistic prayer. I'm saying thank you when I receive the Eucharist. Um, so you're, it's a good disposition of the faithful to have. 
Owing to an ex excess of external action, there tends to be less appreciation for interior action and the responsibility of the laity to re um, relive in themselves the sentiments and thoughts of Christ. Uh, action is primarily receptive. This is coming from Britain now. And you remember the example that he has here? That action tends to be receptive. Where is he getting that from? Which model in Scripture who is the most fruitful but also the most receptive? The Blessed Virgin Mary. She's very contemplative. She's pondering over what God has said to her. And you cannot argue that she is not the most fruitful person in the whole wide world, right? With her uh, receptive disposition that she has. Reception precedes action. It comes before action. Action presupposes that you've received. You cannot give what you do not have. Uh, to be an active does not mean to do stuff. It means primarily to be still and to be receive. It is a conscious recognition of what is happening to you, not what you are doing. So that is the same thing what I just said, paying attention when your heart jumps or when something speaks to you or um, you just notice something for the first time. Jean Cobain, uh, he is a great writer. He wrote uh, one of the most famous books called The Wellspring of Worship. He said the most fruitful activity of the human person is to be able to receive God. That's a fantastic quote. Right? The most fruitful activity of the human person is to receive God. Uh, in the ways, you will be the most effective person the more receptive you are. Yesterday, I went to go see the Mother Teresa movie. And in part of the little documentary they had was they were pretty emphatic that we are not social workers. Um, we uh, take an hour in the morning before we do anything, before the Blessed Sacrament, and we adore Jesus. In other words, we, we, we adore him in the Eucharist, and we thank him and love him in the poor. So as uh, Mary Jo Copeland says, we touch Jesus in the Eucharist, and we touch him in the poor. So that's her big line, right? We touch him in the Eucharist, and we touch him in the poor. So they have to receive first, and then they go out, and they spend themselves in their love for the poor, and then they come back, and they receive again. You can kind of see this dynamic movement of reception, gift, and then come back to be filled again. Reception and giving. So reception leads to giving, which then goes back to reception again. So you have this kind of beautiful flow. Does that make sense? Otherwise, you just end up empty. And it's all just self, um, hidden form of pride. It's just a self-reliance. It's all that kind of stuff. And that doesn't glorify God. That's just your own ego that's acting there. Before I lost active participation means to be contempl contemplatively and prayerfully engage in the liturgical action of the Mass, the traditions and official prayers of the Church. The real action liturgy in which we are all supposed to participate is the action of what God is doing in liturgy. This is what is new and distinctive about Christian liturgy. God himself acts and does what is essential. Are you aware of and receptive to of God's work in you at the Mass? Okay. Now, uh, some more reforms of SC. Uh, Sundays have primacy over saints' memorials. So a good example of that would be last Sunday, this last Sunday, what normally would we have celebrated on October 2nd? The guardian angels, right? So you can't be like, well, let's just celebrate guardian angels. Uh, so if it lands on a Sunday... That means it's going to lose a year in some sense, unless it's a really important, then they'll move it over to a Monday. Uh, so this year, Guardian Angels got skipped, right, because it happened to land on a Sunday. So, um, so Sunday, the day of the resurrection, always has precedence over saints' memorials because Jesus comes first. Rituals are to be simplified, reformed to show their inner nature and purpose, adapt to meet modern men and women. RCAIA was restored, Right, so those wanting to come into the church, um, this year we have 10 or 11, I think, or 12 folks looking at coming into the church. Wow. Thank you, Jesus, right? Great backgrounds, too. It's super, super great backgrounds they have. You already see the Holy Spirit working in their lives. Because I was there, and they were each sharing their story of you know, how God has been present to them and acting in their lives. And it's just beautiful to see how God has been working in their lives. Liturgy of the hour, especially Vespers, that's evening prayer, 
to be celebrated in common on Sundays and feasts and other hours should return to the ancient standard. Okay, good. Oh, this was my plug here. So Word on Fire, which is Bishop uh, Barron's, um, you know, his ministry there, um, he introduced recently the Liturgy of the Hours, and he did it so that um, you get a booklet or a little book each month. And what's nice about it is that you don't have to flip back and forth because that's what people confuse. Like, where am I right now? I got tons of ribbons here. I'm confused. I'm not getting anything out of this. Until you get used to it, it's really frustrating. So he did it in a way that all you got to do is turn the page. That's it. So he's got seven bucks a month. Um, no page flipping that causes confusion. And I know a good number of faithful here at, already at uh, St. Therese have purchased that and love it. So you can pray in the morning, the morning prayer. It has daytime prayer. It's very short. Then you have evening prayer, and then you have night prayer before you sleep. And you're praying the Psalms, and you're praying with thousands and thousands and thousands of other people who are praying those exact same prayers and those exact same uh, readings as well. Um, we as priests, um, we made a promise or a vow that we would pray our Liturgy of the Hours every single day and never skip it. So this morning I did my office of readings, my morning prayer, I just have to do my daytime prayer, evening prayer, and night prayer tonight. So it's five times a day. We stop like the Jewish cycle, right? They would stop five times a day, and we would say prayers, and you kind of sanctify the whole day. So the whole day is sanctified uh, through prayer. It's, just, it's really lovely, actually. There are times when I get really busy, and it's like nine at night, and I haven't done my evening prayer, and I like start sweating like crazy. I'm like, I got to get my evening prayer, and I just, I'm not going to commit a terrible sin by not doing my liturgy hours. Um, a bishop... Who's the Bishop of New York? Dolan? Yeah. He wrote a nice little book called Priests for the Third Millennium. He, um, when I was reading over that book, he said that if a priest is going to fall away from his ministry and become secular or worldly or get into trouble, you know, sexual stuff or whatever it is, right? You know, all that romantic stuff. The first thing that always goes is what? Yep, Exactly. So he gave this one story where the bishop called the priest in and was like, uh, well, okay, you got in a lot of trouble here. Uh, I guess you don't have to pray the Liturgy of the Hours anymore. That's pretty much done for you. And he goes, well, I haven't prayed that in years. Makes sense. Really makes sense, right? You gave up your promise of what you're supposed to do years ago. So the first thing that will always go, typically, will be your Liturgy of the Hours, right? You just discard that. And it makes sense. Uh, I've always remembered that, you know, 15 years later. Make sure I do my prayers, my liturgy of the hours. Otherwise, your heart starts to stray. Kind of like Peter when he denied Christ, right? He got a crack, and then it gets worse, then it gets worse. And pretty soon, he's denying a little girl. Well, I, don't, I don't know who he is, right? He's afraid of a little girl at the end, right? Um, and so you can see what happens, how a man can sort of go, go astray. The other one is uh, a priest, uh, if you watch or participate the way he celebrates the Mass, that will tell you a lot about his spirituality and where he is in his prayer life. Um, many years ago, um, there was a priest who lost his way. Obviously, I'm not going to say his name. And I hadn't seen him for years. And I went to a daily mass, and I showed up, and he walked in, and I said, this is, this is like a walking zombie. Uh, the mass was so flat. There was no love in it. The prayers didn't mean anything. It was all just completely perfunctory for him. I said, this man is just, he's lost. Is a lost soul. And so had, there's no love in the Mass anymore. There's no prayers. There's no joy that's there. So kind of watch the way a priest... Now, don't start, like, judging me every time I celebrate the Mass now. Like, oh, Father Andre, he must be having a bad day, or what's he doing? <laughs> so, sometimes we just have an off day, right? Yeah, this, they they let you know, right, brother? Yeah, they'll let you know. Uh, but sometimes you do have an off day, and you're just, you know, you're like, I'm trying here. I'm just, my heart is just not... And that's self-sacrifice, you still do the best you can to present yourself. Sometimes it's great. It's, you know, mass like your first mass. And then sometimes you're like, I'm just so tired or I'm grumpy inside or whatever it is. And you can't let that come out. You, you, that, uh, that has a bad perfume, so to speak, if that makes any sense. So that make any sense? Okay. The other thing they did is the cycle of readings were revised. So for those of you that are close to the church, you know that um, for Sundays, there's an A, B, and C cycle, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So right now on cycle C, 
it's Luke, and, um, and then the daily mass has a two-year cycle, right? So just a year one and year two, that's there. And then uh, the council also told priests, for heaven's sakes, give some decent sermons, right? Give some decent sermons. So we have like four or five homiletics classes in seminary where it's some humbling experiences, let me tell you, because your brothers lay into you. All your stuff, you know, like, why are you doing this with your hands? Or you're too long, your voice inflection's annoying, or your mannerisms. It's like you just combed up and down, right? You, f- you feel like you're so defeated when you leave. You're too long, or whatever it is, right? Or, you know, uh, you get all kinds of comments about it. But at, at the end of the day, let's be honest, there are some, some priests are gifted in this area, some are okay, and some are like, Oh my gosh, this is like eating broken glass here. Like, make it short, Father. You have other gifts. This is not one of them. Uh, type of, if this makes sense. So, priests, it's just a matter of where are you on that particular uh, spectrum. Yeah. Uh, okay, now, ad orientum, towards the east, or versus populum, towards or versus the people. So, this is the whole thing here about which direction is the priest celebrating the Mass, right? Uh, Pope Paul VI, uh, first of all, this isn't even mentioned in the document, right? So this isn't even mentioned in Sacrosanctum. It's a little bit ironic. This has become one of the highest points of contention, which is not even mentioned in the document. So Paul VI had begun celebrating versus Populum around Rome before uh, V2 concluded. The consuls stress on full, conscious, active participation in the need for greater simplicity and coherence in rituals, royal priesthood of all the faithful, in other words, by virtue of baptism, we participate in Christ's priesthood, mixed with modern architectural preferences. They really all kind of tipped the scale, so to speak, towards versus populum. Next couple of slides, I'm going to prevent just arguments for both, if that makes any sense. So I know some people here have strong preferences for one versus other. I just want you to realize in the tradition of the church, there are strong reasons actually for both. Does that make any sense? So for somebody to say it's 100%, this is the only reason, you're not looking at the full picture. So uh, let's take a look at some of the reasons for both. The theology of ad orientum, towards the east. So in other words, sometimes you say the priest with the back to the people, but in reality, they're praying, the priest is praying towards the east, towards the Lord. We're all praying in the same direction. That's, that's the theology there. Uh, we're all face towards Christ who comes from the east and will come again. So the traditional direction of liturgical prayer for Jews and Christians has always been toward the east. Where does that come from? Well, in the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible, God planted the Garden of Eden in the east. Uh, The temple of Jerusalem also faced east. Uh, All Jews would pray toward the temple as an expression of that unity, that we're all one people, and the fact that the sacrifices are being offered in the temple to bring about reconciliation with God is a sign of hope. So they're kind of this eastward kind of thrust towards, uh, of prayer towards the east. Okay, next slide. Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, he has this vision where the temple is going to be restored because it had been destroyed by the Babylonians, in which he sees God's glory coming from the east, where the temple facing the east flows with life-giving water cascading eastward, right? So you know the um, Ezekiel 47, where from the facade of the temple, this water is coming out, this fresh water, and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper, right? The point you can only, you have to swim across it. And it says that it makes everything fresh, and it provides life for everything, that's faced towards the east. Additionally, the sun rises from the east, so Christ will come again from the east. We are pilgrim people on the way facing the Lord. So the traditional direction of Catholic parishes has always been toward the east, right? They used to always build them towards the east. Yeah. The, fa- the priest and people were all facing one direction towards the east. Right. Now, if the priest turns around, sometimes the priest is facing towards the west. If he's facing towards the people, he would be facing towards the west. Right? Yeah. 
And actually, even like in baptism, uh, before you are baptized, you turn towards the West. You renounce your sins because that's towards the, the devil, right? I don't want to be a part of this anymore. And then you would turn towards the East, right, to be baptized. So that even that was built into the sacrament of baptism. Um, now, there are some advantages of versus populum. It emphasizes the whole Christ, Christ the head, sacramentally uh, represent or represented the ordained priest. So I represent Christ the head and his body, the faithful, offering Jesus Christ in the Eucharist and being offered your joys, pains, sufferings, and sins and the Eucharistic prayer. So it's not just the you know, priest by himself doing his thing. And then there's kind of a sentimental or emotional sort of thing where it enables the lay faithful to participate more fully in the Eucharistic prayer and so enter more deeply into the Mass, as so it's felt. For example, the lay faithful can hear the spoken words of the Mass better. So as my aunt says, I feel like I'm participating or more a part of the Mass when the priest is faced towards me, right? So that's the kind of the sentimental um, sort of like you, you're actually an emotional connection that's there. Then you feel you're, like you're participating more in the Mass, so this, that, that kind of thing's going on. So there are kind of pros and cons to both. And then there's also dangers to the both when they're kind of abused or not done well. Did we lose something there? Oh, it's rebooting there. As, as that's rebooting, um, what uh, one of the drawbacks, I think, of the East is, again, you just don't feel like you're participating as much, right? So it kind of feels a bit more mystery hidden. What do you think one of the drawbacks of versus populum would be? If you had a guess. Towards the people. Well, not the dog. <laughs> kind of nice, though. My computer just rebooted by itself, so. Okay, that means you're done. We're very close. You want to bring us down there, uh, Pat, where our slide is? <laughs> Yeah. Um, in the book, it talks about the priest holding up the chalice. You know, it's basically an East priest who is um, facing the East and has consciousness of the times. And, and when he held up the chalice and has consciousness that he could see the reception of the people, he and the people were to all together offer. Praying it together, right? We're all one we're offering. We're all in the same direction, right? We're all together in this. Person of Christi, yeah. Yeah, so there's some of the advantages, at least for the priest, is uh, it, it's a little easier actually to pray the Mass. Uh, you know, there's because I've celebrated Mass both ways, and it's a little bit more intimate, and it's a little easier for the priest not to get distracted, so to speak, because it's pretty easy for the priest to get distracted with just all the stuff that's going on, right? Little kids running around and, you know, noises and yelps and everything. So that's one. Uh, advantage of towards the east. I think theologically it's good too. I think, you know, versus populum has the great intimacy that's there. I think one of the dangers is it can become father so-and-so's show, if that makes any sense, right? It becomes too uh, focused on this particular priest and his personality. And the priest shouldn't, that shouldn't be the case, right? The priest should be really quite small, actually. He should simply be a window into Christ. And especially if you have a priest who has a big ego or who has insecurity or whatever, and he needs that attention on him, it can turn into his thing, his father so and so show. So um, that's a great danger of uh, versus populum, if that makes any sense. And it's it's terrible for the people, right? It's not about you. Right. Yeah, and that's a lack of understanding of what the mass is. It's all stuck. Well, 
Well, let me just say, um, as we kind of conclude here, is um, so Pope uh, Benedict actually came up with kind of a solution to this or kind of a compromise. Um, at the Vatican, he had versus populum, but then he has these big uh, candlesticks that were on the front of the altar and a crucifix that was pretty big as well. And he would say, well, look, y'all get to look at Jesus on the cross, but I don't, right? So I'm going to put a big crucifix here. And so he celebrated Mass toward the people, but he also had kind of, it was like a, kind of like a screen in a way, in some sense, right? You could still see him easily, but he was able to look at the crucifix and then have that tie between the Eucharist and the cross. So if you look at the Vatican, when he had celebrated Mass, he had these big candle stands, and he also had the crucifix uh, that was there as well. So he had this kind of compromise, if that makes any sense, that's there. I don't know if you followed um, the Cyril Malabar Church. is really struggling with, with this right now. So there's a situation that was just reported yesterday where um, they, Pope Francis said, we're going to do 50-50. So like half the Mass, in some sense, when you're speaking to the people, is going to be toward the people. And when you're speaking to God, it's going to be ad orientum, towards the people. Well, this particular diocese uh, in India, which is an hour north of where the sisters live, um, they want versus populum the entire time. And so uh, the new bishop came in and said, no, we're going to have ad orientum for part and versus populum for some of it. And he wrote a letter to the faithful saying, this is what we're going to do. And the faithful then went out and took the letter and burned it uh, and like out of anger and said, we don't want it, right? And so I said to poor sister, I said, sister, I'm so sorry. What's happening there? And she said, oh, please pray, pray, pray. You know, pray, pray, pray. It's, it's so important to pray. They're being so disobedient to what the Holy Father wants there. So it's, you know, we'll have, they're going to have to kind of figure that out, right? So um, that's just pride, right? That's just a sort of an arrogance that's there, you know. So they're, they're struggling in that particular diocese that's there. Oh, there we go. All right, we're almost done. Hang in there with me. Keep going, keep going. Oh, go back up to that brood screen. Or the, um, a little bit more. Right there. One, one down. See that altar there? That's a, high mass. That's a high mass, yep. But he's also got those big candlesticks that are there. You see that? Okay, let's go to the next one there. Um, Latin and vernacular. Uh, this has been very peaceful over the years, hasn't it? Oh, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> So that a vocal minority of didn't uh, want any vernacular at all. Uh, the influence of Eastern Rite bishops, Latin, they would argue that that's not the universal language of the church. We in the West always argue it's universal. They would say that's not true. So um, go down to one more. It's got a phone there. Uh, with a doubt, Christ, oh, let's go past that one. That's, that's Brennan's slide there because we're getting. Um, SC promotes a, a compromise of Latin and the vernacular. Are you able to hit that little, um, to make that thing there bigger? It says the use of the Latin language is to be preserved in Latin rites, but since the use of vernacular may frequently be of great advantage to the people, a wider use of it uh, may be made of it. Ideally, the Mass should make use of both Latin and vernacular. For example, the proper parts of the Mass, such as the Eucharistic prayer and its responses, could be in Latin, whereas the readings, homily, and prayers of the faithful could be in the vernacular. When shared directly in Christ's adoration of the Father, priests speak in the universal language of the church. When speaking to the people and the mystery of Christ, they could speak in the vernacular. So that's Britain's uh, take on that, is when you're speaking to God in the universal language of the church, that could be, parts could be in Latin, and then when you're speaking to the people, that could be in English. Regardless of whatever you, you take in this particular, there should be some Latin in the uh, mass is the big argument there because it is the universal part of the church. Just recently, there's a parish in the archdiocese that got all up in arms because the one of my brother priests who I was ordained with um, was bringing some Latin into the liturgy, and they said, "Yes, the Second Vatican Council doesn't want any Latin." Okay, that's clearly very not educated congregation because that's not what the Second Vatican Council said. It said Latin should be preserved and should be sprinkled throughout the, uh, the liturgy here and there, right? So that's there. Okay, go down one more slide there. Um, I'm going to pass this one because of time. Music. Oh, gosh, another very calming uh, topic, right? Everybody's got an opinion on music. Uh, at the end of the day, music 
should lift your heart and mind to God. It should be sacred music, right? Uh, musical heritage should be preserved and cultivated in choirs and full congregation. It's interesting that it says that Gregorian chant is the natural music of Roman liturgy holds pride of place. Wow. Yeah. So that sort of sacred music has, should hold pride of place. Somewhere over the last 50 years, we lost our way on that. But that's kind of the way it, what's going to happen, I think, over the next 50 years is I think the church is going to kind of regain her footing, and I think you're going to start to see some more of that kind of sacred uh, Gregorian chant will start to slowly make its way back into the church again. You can't get rid of it, right? So it's going to slowly make its way back into the church. And a lot of the younger musicians are certainly moving in that particular uh, direction that's there. That just takes some catechesis of the faithful and uh, some acceptance of that particular style of music. Okay, let's move on now to visual art and architecture. The purpose of sacred art, sacred music, and sacred buildings is to reveal the mysteries of faith. They are intended to foster contemplation of the divine mysteries, of the divine, I got that in there twice, in continuity with art forms of tradition so as to allow for a genuine encounter with Jesus Christ and the Holy Eucharist and other sacraments of the church. Uh, uh, Dostoevsky uh, said that beauty will save the world. In other words, our churches should be incarnational. Uh, we take the incarnation serious of Jesus Christ and we can depict him in statues and vibrancy and colors and warmth. Uh, and so they shouldn't be stark, if that makes any sense. I was recently in a Lutheran church. It was sort of near here. And I, I said, oh, I'm going to check this out. Go up there and check and what it's like in the sanctuary. I walked in there. So cold. Very cold. Like no color. <laughs> No statues, nothing. I thought, ooh, this would be a tough place to, pl to pray. Yeah. No, nothing. Like, I was like, this would be a tough place to pray. Uh, so there is a sense of warmth that's there. What's that? Yeah, you'll sing the heck out of You'll wear that hymnal out in about two weeks, though. At the Lutheran uh, Mighty Fortress is our God. So one of the things, obviously, we're doing, you can hear right now, a little irony, is... We're warming up that sanctuary with some of that warmer stone, lifting up the altar three steps to heighten the beauty of the Eucharist. Um, starting to think about, you know, the crucifix, the big crucifix, maybe moving that over the center, over the altar to make Jesus the center of what we do there, bringing a statue of Mary and Joseph. So the whole idea here is we're trying to help people to pray. right? We're trying, like when you come in here, you say, well, this clearly is not Walmart. This is very different. This is very different than a, a, than a Target or a Walmart. This is a sacred place, and I'm actually invited to pray, right? I'm encouraged to pray that when I come in here. Stations, yeah. stations are, well, they're here. Uh, they're just boxed up because you've got to protect them. This is my favorite church in the United States of America, the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist in Savannah. Uh, you can see the well, one picture there on the outside. Uh, this is from 1873. It's a Gothic-style church. Uh, the inside of that church, when you walk in, it's like, oh, my goodness. Look at this thing. Even Protestants. You know, Catholics are only about less than 10% uh, in Georgia. But it, there's tons and tons of people coming through there and praying, Protestants, uh, because why? They're attracted to beauty. Beauty is a—it's non-discriminatory. It's just—it's you know—it's a sense that we're all drawn to beauty, and it, it wants you to pray. It's—it's it's and it, your heart lifts up to the ceiling, right, to God when you go in there. So it, it just draws you to prayer, uh, right away. All right, I think we are there. That's uh, I'm not going to say too much about that. Let's go to the last slide there. So our next meeting is going to be October 18th, and we're going to talk about Lumen Gentium which is the light of the nations. It's the nature of the church. And um, lovely document. Do you have any questions? Uh, yes, Jim. Oh, well, it's up there too, right? It's easily in the top 10. Church of the Sacred, uh, Basilica of the Sacred Heart at Notre Dame is another uh, extraordinary church. Uh, Notre Dame's stained glass windows 
are like out of this world, right? So they're from France. They're, they're fantastic. Now they're a great church. Sure. Questions are, what is a sacramental? Do you have some examples of sacramentals? Uh, it can be a gesture. The sign of the cross is a sacramental. It can be holy water. Rosary, in some sense, is a sacramental. Um, medals that I wear. Um, incense is a sacramental. Bells are sacramental. So they're all um, either a gesture or an object that moves me to love Jesus more and helps me to um, acknowledge his presence in my life, and they draw me um, more deeply into the heart of the Mass. Does that make sense? Uh, laity is always true about the, the non-ordained or the lay faithful, so it's a baptized man or woman who is not either a consecrated religious, a deacon, priest, or bishop. Yeah, I know that, but, but what's the, the term? What does that mean? I always, have, I always thought it was kind of a weird term. Laity? Where does it, where does it originate? i got to look that up. Does you know that the uh, etymology of laity? That I don't know. I, there's got to be like a... Yeah, or I can look it up for you and, and we can share it with you. Well, I think the apse, like the front of the church where the altar is, that typically faced uh, east. And then you came in from, I believe, the west, right? Think about, well, let me think about what, what, what's a good example of a church, right? Yeah, ours is the opposite way, though, right? Ours is facing west. Is that how is it there? Okay. Oh, that's true. That's a good point there. I'm trying to think of the cathedral and the basilica. That. Basilica. Which direction is basilica facing? South. Cathedral. That's facing east, though, isn't it? Yes, that's facing that. The altar is facing east, and you come in. Yeah, the people are facing east. That's cruciform shape. The, the cathedral is a cruciform shape. You know, the the cross. Let me think about that. Look at that. Yeah. Ordinary people. Yeah, there you go. You're just ordinary, average, vanilla people. Yeah, it's got to have an it's got to have an etymology. It's ordinary, right? Yeah, probably from the Latin, I would think. Legos. Oh, of the people. Is it L E G O S? Oh, Legos. Okay, of the people or pertains to the people, probably. Yeah, the ordinary people got to go home, right? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pray for your special blessing, Lord Jesus, upon the lay faithful. We thank you for their baptism and all they do for your church. I pray that uh, they might be sanctified each day and they come to know you and love you uh, in and through Jesus. We ask this through Christ our Lord. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, did you learn something? Yes. All right.